So um, this is work that I'm presenting today that I've done uh, jointly with uh, Gregory Cooper, Daniel Myers, and Michael uh, Piatek at Google Seattle. The name of the system is Thialfi, which is the Norse messenger god for the Norse god called Thor. So that's why the name of the system is Thialfi, since it's a messaging god. Um, so what I'm going to be describing to you is a system uh, that we've been building at Google and have deployed it that delivers fast and reliable notifications to millions of users for a variety of applications. So let's see why you would need such a system. So if you think about current mobile and web applications, they are characterized by data sharing for users and their devices. So if you think about a calendar app, um, you want to view it on your phone, modify it in your browser, share it with your colleagues. The authoritative data, uh, calendar data resides somewhere in the cloud in a data center, but you want to keep these cached copies up to date. And the, the basic requirement for keeping these cached copies up to date is that the calendar application running on these uh, devices needs to be informed that something has changed. And that's what we're going to talk about in, the, uh, in this talk today, which is how do you deliver notifications to all these devices? And you have to do, the, do this at a very large scale to millions of users and devices while providing good semantics in the presence of a variety of failures. So you might be thinking, don't applications already do this? In fact, they do. They use a couple of mechanisms. First is polling. So if you have a calendar application, that will poll its back end every few minutes saying, has something changed? Has something changed? It's simple, and it's reliable, because if you miss something in your first poll, you'll get it in the next one. But it's slow. It takes a few minutes to get your updates. And it's inefficient, because most of the time, you don't get any data. But you have to poll quickly so that you get changes uh, fast to the client. So that ends up loading the server unnecessarily. So some applications actually try to push updates to the client, which is great, because it's fast. However, developers soon realize that sending reliable updates to clients is kind of difficult, especially in the presence of offline clients. So they tend to sacrifice reliability. Well, now you have a problem that the data may not be delivered to a client. So well, what do you do? You add up a, a polling path, which is, instead of few minutes, is few hours. So that's good. Now you got, got back your correctness. However, what happens is that your tail latencies can be pretty high. And more importantly, if you get a notification after a few hours, you don't know whether this was an expected message drop or it's actually masking a bug. And finally, these protocols tend to be very application specific and diff diff difficult to generalize. And what you really want is a general system that would push notifications to end uh, applications. And that's what Thialfi is. It's an end client notification system that is scalable, it tracks millions of objects and clients, and it is low latency in the sense that it can deliver notifications to clients in less than a, se uh, less than a second. It provides good semantics in that the client learn about the latest version of an object, uh, even when a wide variety of failures are happening, including when entire data centers fail. It's easy to use, as is evidenced by the fact that it's been integrated and deployed in a number of Google applications, uh, including Chrome Sync, Contacts, and Google+. So here's an uh, outline of my, uh, the rest of my talk. I'm first going to talk about the abstraction that Thialfi provides, which is it sends a reliable signal to the clients and not reliable data. Then I'll show you the uh, Thialfi internal architecture and show how notifications are delivered in the common case, I'll talk a little bit about the kind of failures we handle and how we handle them, and then describe uh, our, uh, briefly our evaluation of our production systems and some of the experience we had building Thialfi. So let's start with an overview of Thialfi. So for a client running, you, trying to use Thialfi, how does it look like? What I'm showing to you over here are two clients, C1 and C2. Uh, one is a browser client and the other is a phone client. So to an application, Thialfi consists of two parts. The first is a library that it links with, uh, the, uh, that's the application links in. This library is available in C++, Java, and JavaScript. And the second part is a service that is running in the data center independent of the application backend that is basically responsible for making sure that these notifications get delivered to the clients. So if a client is interested in uh, getting notifications for object X, it makes a call into the Thialfi client library. The library forwards this call to the service running in the data center and which tracks the fact that C1 and C2 are now interested in this object X. 
At some point, C2 makes a change to an object, this particular object X. The application backend makes the change and forwards this call to Thialfi saying, hey, X has changed. The Thialfi service says C1 and C2 are interested in it. Let me send them this notification. We have support to suppress uh, notifications to clients like C2 who originated the uh, update, but I'm not going to talk about that over here. So when the client library gets this uh, message, it invokes an event on the application saying X has changed, and at this point, the application is free, whatever it wants to do with this object. Uh, in particular, it could just go and fetch the latest version of the object. All right, now we have a high-level overview. What is the abstraction that Thialfi provides? So Thialfi doesn't actually store the objects. It's the application backends that store it. But there's a, the application just need, need a way to name the objects. And for that, we have object IDs, which are just byte strings from Thialfi's perspective. Objects also have version numbers, uh, which are 64-bit in our current implementation. And we expect application backends to monodolically increase them after every update. And the reason we have that is because we provide a, a strong guarantee that if a client has registered for an object X, it will be told about the latest version number of that object. And note that I'm talking about the latest version number and not actually the version data. So one way to think about it is that applications are caching objects in their uh, client cache. And Thialfi is basically a cache invalidation system that informs clients, hey, as an object is stale, why don't you go and refresh it? So you might be wondering at this point, wh why do we deliver a reliable signal? Why not data? Um, in fact, this is what de developers come to us. They basically say, um, we need a pub sub system that delivers reliable in-order data to our client applications. And we thought about this in the beginning. And we realized that it actually creates problems not only for Thialfi internally, but also for the client application. So for Thialfi, we actually end up having to reliably store state. We have to also do arbitrary buffering for offline clients. And that turns out to be a huge problem for applications. So when application writers talk to us about this, we go and tell them, hey, would you be OK when your offline clients come back that we give them 50 to 100 megabytes of data? Uh, can your JavaScript client handle them? And their immediate reaction is, can you coalesce this? And after thinking of it, they realize that they are best well positioned to coalesce their own data because they understand the semantics. And a, a, a signal is actually good enough for them. And this turns out to be a, actually a big win for them as well. Because when they get the signal, they typically end up invoking their polling path. So the amount of effort they have to use to integrate a Thialfi turns out to be quite minimal. And we'll see that uh, a bit later. All right. So now that we understand the semantics and the data model, what about the API? So what I'm showing you over here is the API without some of the uh, calls that are needed for failure recovery. There are about four or five of them. I'll talk about two of them later, and the rest are discussed in the paper. So on the client side, the application can uh, express interest for no re receiving notification for an object or say that it's not interested in uh, receiving notifications by using the register and unregister calls. The application also implements an interface so that events can be invoked on it. And in particular, the client library can invoke an event uh, called notify, which tells the application that an object has changed and here's a new version number. On the server side, uh, the service exposes a call called publish, which the application backend can use to inform Thialfi about the latest version for a particular object. All right, so now we have an idea about how Thialfi uh, is like uh, in terms of programming. How about uh, its architecture? So what I'm showing you over here is the same picture I had for the client, where the client library is embedded in the application. On the server side, what I've done is I've taken the service box and expanded it to show you how Thialfi runs in one data center. In particular, there are two server types that we have. The first one is called the matcher, which is partitioned by object ID, and it tracks uh, the latest version of the object and this, uh, the set of clients that are interested in that uh, particular object in a table called the object big table. Big table is a highly available storage system av available at Google. So the job of the matcher is that when an application backend uh, sends notifications to it, it matches the clients who are interested in that object and sends this information to a server called the registrar. The registrars are a set of servers that are partitioned by client ID that in its table called the uh, client big table, they track all the objects that the client has registered for and any pending notifications. The registrar is also the server 
that is responsible for running a protocol between the client, a library, and itself, uh, where it basically uh, delivers notifications, uh, receives registration requests, and acknowledgments for notifications. And you might notice that there is some amount of redundancy in the two tables. Our basic model is to always modify one table and then asynchronously propagate changes to the other table. All right, so let's see how does the notification flow in the common case. So this is the same picture, except what I'm showing you here is that there's an object X that has been registered to by client C1 and C2. C1 is offline, so it's not being shown. Client C2 is online, and that's being shown in the, uh, in the picture. So if you look at the object big table, there's one row for object X, which uh, has the latest version for object X v5, and two clients, C1 and C2, registered for it. In the client big table, you have two rows for C1 and C2, both of them registered for X. And for C1, there's a pending notification for version 5, prob probably because it's offline. Whereas the client C2 is up to date and has no pending notification, probably because it's online. So let's say an application uh, backend sends a message to uh, indicate that here's a new version of object X, V7. The matcher takes this uh, request and sends it to the big table and overwrites V5 with V7. At this point, the matcher responds to the application backend, and it's basically committed the fact that Thialfi is now responsible to, of making sure that the client receives the latest version of the object. The matcher then reads this row from big table and forwards this call to the registrar, which does two things in parallel. First, it figures out which clients are online, which is C2 in this case, and sends a notification to it. The second thing it does is that it sends two writes to big table to track the fact that uh, there the, are pending notifications for both clients C1 and C2. And the reason it does that is to take care of crashes and also the fact that client C1 may come back uh, later uh, and be online. So when client C2 acts the response to the registrar, the registrar goes and clears its uh, pending notification. And at this point, the notification is, uh, cycle is complete. There are more details in the paper about the whole architecture and the registration and notification paths. All right, so let's actually look at some of the failures that um, Thialfi tackles. So what I'm showing you over here is a high level view of how Thialfi runs in production. So what I took, did on the server side, I took the box I had for one data center, and I've made n such boxes in this, in this picture to show you n data centers. There's a feed coming from the application backend. And on the client side, there's a network that connects the client uh, library and the client application. And there's a local store on the client, which could be a browser HTML5 or, uh, or a cookie store, or it could be a SQL store for mobile devices such as Android. All right, so what kind of uh, failures can we handle, or are we supposed to handle? Well, applications can restart. They can restart and lose all their local state. Moving down, this is a distributed system. You can have all kinds of network failures. How about on the server side? Well, even though we are using big table, you can still have scenarios in which very small parts of the table might be available for short periods of time. You need to handle that. Well, worse, could you lose all your storage? Well, it turns out, no, Bigtable is a reliable system. You don't lose all your storage. But what if you want to deliberately lose it? And you say, why would you want that? Well, if you think about it, if you can handle server state loss, you can tackle problems like schema migration very easily. Because if you want to migrate from one format of your Bigtable row to another, you can just model it as server state loss and just start up with a new format. And we have done this several times, so it has been very handy. And finally, an entire data center may fail whether planned, unplanned, whether for short periods of time or for days, you have to be able to deal with that. So this is the list of failures I just talked about. Uh, they're described in more detail in the paper. I don't have time to talk about all of them. So what I'm going to do is give you the high-level mechanisms and uh, principles that we use to address them. So when we started this project, we were aware of some of the failures, but not like all of them. But we had this mindset that we wanted to build Thialfi with soft state. We wanted to maintain the property that even if we lose all Thialfi state, we wanted the system to be correct. And what do I mean by that? So all the registration state in the client library and the registration state on the server side, if you lose that, we want it to be correct. 
And if you lose even the latest version number state, you wanted the system to work correctly. And note when I say so all, all state is soft state, what I mean is all Thialfi state is soft state. Application backends have hard state with their objects and versions. We don't control that. So our model is actually simple. We try to basically detect failures and either reconstruct the state after failure or have enough information be provided to the client application so that safety is not compromised. And we use three mechanisms. The first is a new event called reissue registrations that helps us in handling loss of registration state uh, at the client library. The second is a protocol called the regist registration sync protocol that we use to keep the client and registra server registration state in sync. And the third is a new event called notify unknown that helps us in recovering from version state loss at the server. So let's look at these. So first thing we're trying to do is what happens if you lose a registration state at the client? What I'm showing you over here is a client application that has registered for objects X and Y. Now let's say the application restarts, comes back, you've lost, the TLF has lost its client state. Well, what we do is we issue an event to the application saying, hey, please re-register all your objects. The client does that, and the Thialfi client library is repopulated. So you might wonder, okay, wait, this made your life easy. What about the application's job? Well, it turns out this is actually very easy for them as well, because typically they are storing these objects in, the, in their cache, and they can run through the index. Or if you have uh, applications like Chrome Sync, what they have is an implicit or a static list of the bookmarks object, the preferences object, or the themes object, and they can run through it as well. So this is actually fairly easy for them to do. All right, continuing with uh, sort of registration state, the, one of the goals we have is we want to keep the client and server registration state in sync. And the way we do that is that every message basically contains a hash of the object IDs from both, in both directions, and we use a SHA-1 hash in our implementation. So, so uh, what do we do when sort of this state go goes out of sync? Let's see that. Suppose the, that uh, object Y is not registered at the server and it doesn't know about it. Why would that have happened? It could have happened because of, let's say, a network uh, failure and a message being dropped. So in the next message, when the client uh, sends to the server, there'll be a hash in it for X and Y. The server will say, aha, my, my hash is not the same as the client. Let me send a registration sync message for the application to the client application saying that we are out of sync. The client sends a register message with all its object IDs. The server realizes it doesn't have Y, adds it, computes the hash, sends it back, and they're back in sync. So this is a really simple protocol, actually. But it helps us in reasoning about registration state without having to take care of all kinds of corner cases. All right, now let's look at version state. As I mentioned earlier, you could use your version state as well. And that could be because we are doing schema migration. We could refresh the state from the back end but there are two reasons why we may not want to do that, and that's why we didn't do them. First is that we talk to a lot of uh, internal backends. We'll have to write custom code for that, fetch code for, with all of them. And more importantly, uh, many application backend uh, uh, service owners are reluctant to expose such a call for performance and operational reasons. So what do we do without compromising safety? What we did is we ended up in, uh, coming up with a new version, num version number called an unknown version number which is incomparable with any other version number in the system. So that when we issue a, a new event called notify unknown to the uh, application client, we're basically saying that the client must refresh its state regardless of the current version number they have. And this technique actually turned out to be very handy when we launched Thialfi initially because we didn't have to populate our tables with version numbers from various application backends. We just started out empty and the tables get, kept getting populated as uh, the notifications rolled in. All right, so let me give you a, sort of a, a brief description of uh, our performance in, in our uh, production systems and share some of our experience. So most of the results are presented in the paper. What I'm actually showing you over here is a breakdown of the latency of uh, a notification after it leaves the application backend and uh, reaches the registrar. And the basic takeaway from this uh, particular uh, slide is that most of the delay, or at least a significant part of the delay, is due to batching that we do for RPCs and big table writes. Um, 
the only two operations we don't batch are the big table read and the message that we get from the application backend to one of our servers called the bridge server that simply translates application messages to our format. And the reason we do batching, as you might imagine, is because there's a trade-off by doing batching uh, where you handle multiple work items in a single request is more efficient than handling one work item per request. And we've actually been playing around with this trade-off. And uh, in fact, the numbers that are presented here are actually better than the ones uh, in the paper. All right, so that's the evaluation. What about uh, usage by various applications? Well, here what I'm showing you are the various application and environments in which Tialfi is used. Um, so the main takeaway from this uh, slide, going from left to right, are that there are many applications that use Tialfi. They're very diverse. They're different languages, C++, JavaScript, and Java. They use different kind of channels to connect. And very importantly, we, and we work very hard for this, is that the number of lines of code you need to integrate with Tialfi, which is primarily on the client side, is actually just a few hundred. All right. So what about the, the, we've been building this system for a while and we've, we have actually evolved it quite a bit. What are some of the lessons we learned? In the paper we describe many more lessons. Here I'm gonna just talk about three of them that we learned. The first is, when we started out, um, since you're building a scalable system and every other system at least I've built, we tried to offload work to the client. And that's how we started out. However, as we built the system, we realized that there were two problems. First, we were shipping this client in a variety of languages and environments. And so that was a pain to maintain. But we still sort of kept going with it. But the second reason was actually worse in terms of complexity of the client, which is that clients may take a long time to upgrade. It could be weeks if you're Chrome, or it could be years or never if you're Android. So you can never deprecate that code. So when we revised our uh, client protocol and client library, we actually added more complexity at the server because it typically takes a few minutes to make a change to a server uh, to the, our servers in the, in the, running in the data center and then push them off to, to various data centers. The second lesson that we learned, which may resonate with some of you, is that we started out initially with our API consisting of callbacks, where an application uh, would register for our object and we would say whether it's uh, registered or not. But we soon realized that we were trying to provide these, this information spontaneously. So instead of making them handle two kinds of calls, we ended up basically with a message passing API, which made things much more simple. And finally, we had actually designed the system for large number of objects per client. But we found that most applications are using one, five, 20 objects per client. And then we delved a little bit deeper and it was very obvious that if you come from polling, would you rather poll for one or five objects or 5,000? So what we did is when we revised our implementation, we optimized for smaller numbers we still store, uh, support large number of objects per client. All right, so what I described to you today was a client notification service uh, system called Thialfi, which provides low latency notifications to end clients. It's fast in the sense that it provides uh, notifications in less than a second. It scales to millions of objects and clients, and it provides good semantics in that Clients learn about the latest version number of an object, uh, even when a large number of failures are happening, including when entire data centers fail. And there are two key properties that helps us in making Thialfi robust. The first is that it delivers a reliable signal to the applications and not reliable data. And the second is that we use soft state for the Thialfi client state and the server state and reconstruct it in case there's a failure. And finally, Tianfi is actually easy to use, as is evidenced by the fact that it's been deployed in several Google applications, and some of them are Chrome Sync, Contacts, and Google Plus. All right, thank you, and I'll take some questions. Um, hi, Yael Lilara from the University of Toronto. Uh, I was wondering if you could describe how this work differs with you know, something like uh, the push-based mechanism that BlackBerry has, which has been around for a significant amount of time, which they use not just for delivery of email, but it's actually open to third-party applications that can send exactly notifications, as actually in their case as well, notifications as well as, as data, and I believe they support a user base of about 70 million or so, so it is scalable. 
So there's not much data available on the BlackBerry Enterprise Server, at least uh, I'm aware. And actually, if you noticed, uh, one of the things I listed over here is a Google BlackBerry Enterprise Server. What ends up happening, at least to my knowledge, is uh, because we work with the Google BlackBerry Enterprise Server team, is that you ba basically you end up delivering notifications to the server running in the enterprise, and that delivers it to the phone. So it's a server-to-server -server kind of a notification mechanism, and internally what they do is not been, at least not been revealed to what I, as I know of. And the server-to-server -server is much different than server-to-client. So what they do from server-to-client, I, I, I just don't know. So. Hi, Mike Freeman, Princeton. Uh, you might talk about this in the paper, but um, in your design, it seems like you, uh, notifications are cached in a row in Bigtable. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if this is used or if you have thoughts about how it actually work when you have you know, a very large number of clients. You know, if you were, let's say, oh, it's a notification service, let's do software upgrade via Thialfi. Ah, so you're, okay, that's a, that's a good question. So you're talking about if you have a huge fan out, for example. Right, lots of people subscribe to lots the same. Or, yes. you know, Kanye West's followers. Right, so this is actually a, a, an issue that has come up many, many times. And the way we sort of kind of work is as applications ask for features, we, we think about them and then we provide them. And this feature has come up, but not really. But we've, we've thought about it quite a bit. So the thing that you have to do for this is you have to make sure that when you do these propagations from the matcher to the registrar is right now, for example, internally what we end up doing is that we propagate and if it fails, we retry the whole thing. So you can't do things like that. You have to, you have to sort of do partial propagation to the registrar if it fails and then you retry only the, the work. I'm, that might be obvious, but the other thing uh, one has to realize is that the amount of state we are maintaining in memory is actually proportional to the number of online clients it's not proportional to all the clients who have registered for it. And depending on the application you look, look at, in many cases, not all, the typical number that I've seen across a variety of applications across uh, in the last few years is 10% of, of your clients are typically online. So we are not maintaining state and memory proportional to all the clients. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wonder if you, know, you start, if you know, Justin Bieber or whatever, he has, I don't know, 5 million followers, 10%, 500,000, you know, put them all on one row in big table. I mean, you, you might not just. Sure. So you, you could imagine starting to look into uh, alternate uh, ways of doing this. Um, in fact, at that point, you may even consider uh, a hybrid solution of, uh, like, doing polling. Right? Do re do, I mean, this system is designed for where people really care about getting things very quickly. Um, if you get somebody's tweet in three minutes, is that the end of the world? Uh, I, I don't know. Right, so. Thank you. Yeah. So while Brad sets up, we have time for a quick question. Marvin Timer, Amazon. So um, when a whole data center goes out, or say you get an internet partition that essentially makes it look like it goes down, yep. do you uh, essentially reconstruct from the servers, or are you also maining replicas in several different data centers? So the, basically the way we do this is we, uh, uh, if, if one data center goes down, the clients get deflected to other data centers. They get uniformly distributed. Um, and over there, either you have that state for that client or you don't. Right. If you don't have it, then the clients will bring you up to date completely. Uh, what we do is we run a best effort replication protocol, so you're mostly up to date. Um, and then the registration sync protocol will make sure that you get completely up to date. Perfect. Thanks. 